Thank you, Rabbi Khan. And uh, it's really nice being back here. Again, I think it is my third or fourth time from this podium, and I suspect that uh, by this time people might be wondering what kind of a rabbi is this. All he's been speaking about to us is Christianity and Buddhism, and uh, now I was exposed as a former anti-Semite. <laughs> so I'll let you wonder about it. <clears throat> it was actually about 31 years ago to the date, maybe off by a few months, that I showed up at Northwestern University as a freshman. And I came into my first year of university with just about no Jewish commitment or knowledge. And as many of you probably are aware, the Chicago area has quite a few Christian seminaries. And our dormitory at Northwestern, I think I lived in a place called Elder Hall, was regularly visited by Christian seminarians trying to ply their trade on us young pagans. And I actually enjoyed uh, schmoozing with these folk, debating with them, although I didn't really take a Jewish position, I tried to really uh, represent humanity at that time. And then, as fate would have it, over the years, my encounters with these very, very committed and passionate Christians was part of the catalyst that really led me uh, on a discovery of my own Juda Judaism and really a career that involves, uh, to a great extent, the interface between Christianity and Judaism. Now, I wanted to say that one caveat before I start today, which is that the topic for today is a bit murky. And the question of who was Jesus is not at all clear. Uh, there were over, actually, I read this number about 10 years ago, so at that point there were over 60,000 books that had been written about the historical personality of Jesus, and very few of them agreed with each other. So I'll be only sharing today uh, my understanding as I've arrived to it at this point, but again I want to lay down the idea that this is not the gospel truth. And I wanted to begin, actually, with a passage from the Christian scriptures, from the Greek Testament. Uh, I know it's not a normal place for a rabbi to begin, but we're discussing Christianity here today, and I thought that it would be appropriate to really begin from a text within the Christian Bible. I had an interesting meeting recently with a Christian when I was speaking near Detroit, and he didn't quite understand why Jewish people have difficulty with the New Testament. So I basically try to have him think about how he as a Christian views the Book of Mormon. And he reacted very violently. He said, that's a terrible book. I said, why? He said, because they added it to the Bible. Right? We had our great Bible, and they just stuck this new edition on the back of the, uh, of the Bible. For him, the Bible, obviously, is the Old and New Testaments. He was upset that the Mormons added on the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants. So I said, well, if you want to understand the Jewish point of view, just think about the fact that we look at you and your Bible in the same way that you look at the Mormons and their Bible. In any event, we're going to be looking at a passage from the book of Acts. Now, in the New Testament, the first four books are the Gospels that really speak about the life and ministry of Jesus. The book of Acts really is the first historical account of the early developing church. And in a very fascinating chapter, chapter 5 in the book of Acts, we're told that the disciples of Jesus were brought to the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, and there was a movement, there was a desire to really, I don't know how to put this politely, to just beat these guys up. There was a feeling that these guys are problematic, that they're uh, in need of some discipline, and there was a prosecution that we have to really show these guys some tough love. And the story, and again, I want to make it clear that we have no evidence this story ever happened, although the characters we're familiar with. It says that the head of the Sanhedrin at that time was Rabbi Gamliel. And Rabbi Gamliel stepped into this crisis, into this call for violence. And he says, gentlemen, I urge you at this point to put these people aside. Do not do anything to them. And then he goes on to say that if their movement is of God, 
if this Jesus movement is a godly movement, then you cannot stop it. And he said, if it's not of God, then he says it'll fall apart by itself. Now think about the implications of this passage. Here, the head of the entire Jewish community is speaking about the nascent Christian movement and says, look, let's wait and see what will happen. And in the context of his remarks, Rabbi Gamliel allegedly makes reference to a few other early Jewish messianic movements. He speaks about Judah of Galilee. He speaks about an Egyptian. Several other people we know from Josephus that there were several people back then, several Jews who claimed to be the Messiah and gathered a small following. So Rabban Gamaliel said, what do you want from these people that follow Jesus? Leave them alone. He says, look what happened to those other movements. Here you had this fellow who arose, thought he was the Messiah, gathered a following. He says, but look what happened. He was ultimately put to death by the Romans. And the movement fizzled out. Look what happened to the other fellow, the Egyptian. Claimed to be the Messiah, gathered a following, had a bit of a rebellion against the Romans. He was squashed, his movement fell apart. So that's what Rabbi Gamaliel says in this story. I urge you, he says, to wait and see. Let's see what happens. If this movement lasts, then maybe uh, there's something to it. If it's not a movement that really has God's imprimatur, then it'll fall apart by itself. Now, Christians read this story, and they lick their chops. Because they say, look, we're still here 2,000 years later. Isn't that the greatest evidence in the world that our faith must be true? Your own rabbi said it. It was your rabbi. It was, it was his test, not our test. He said, if it's of God, you can't stop it. This is a movement that started with 12 Jewish guys. Now there's 2 billion of them. The largest church in the world today, interestingly enough, is in South Korea. It has a million members. Not a denomination, one church. I just got back from Orlando. I attended the annual meeting of the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. This is a conference I've been going to for the past 16 years. And uh, I had this discussion, actually, with one of the Messianic, the Jew for Jesus rabbis at this conference, because he raised this passage. And I said, let's really think together about what happened in this story. Who do we imagine? Think about this. Let's all of us put on our thinking caps. Who do we imagine in this story, if it happened, Rabbi Gamaliel was speaking to and speaking about? <coughs> who was Peter? Who was James? Who were these people back then who were students and followers of Jesus? Were they Sunday, Sabbath-observing, pork-eating Baptists that believed in a trinity? You have to understand that today's Christian makes that assumption. Today's Christian projects himself or herself all the way back 2,000 years and assumes that the people who were hanging out with Jesus, right, didn't observe the Sabbath on Saturday. They had a Sunday. And they probably ate pork and bacon. And they probably believed that Jesus was God himself and prayed to him as the third member of the Trinity. And therefore, they read this story and they say, look, that's wonderful. We were around back then, and we're still here. That's proof positive that our movement has to have legs. I wanted to spend a few moments just examining the evidence from, again, the Christian scriptures about who Jesus was and what his movement was about. If anyone's read through the Gospels, one fact emerges very clearly. What is the major teaching of Jesus? The words that came out of his mouth most frequently. And this can be measured simply by counting. And it starts before Jesus with John the Baptist, Yochanan Hamatbil, they call him in the Messianic world. The major teaching was the kingdom of God is at hand which means that the present world order is going to end. And the world that we live in of war and strife and persecution and a lack of Jewish political sovereignty in the land of Israel, 
That is soon to end. And God is going to bring his kingdom of peace and truth to the world. We will get rid of the Romans. We will have our own state in Israel, have a spiritual religious state, our own control, where we will be a light to the nations to spread the Torah and God's word. That's what it meant 2,000 years ago to say the kingdom of God is at hand. And those are the words that came out of the mouth of Jesus over and over and over again. That's what his followers believed. There is not one time when Jesus said that I'm coming to take Judaism and flush it down the toilet. As a matter of fact, one of his most famous speeches, the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, Jesus says, think not that I have come to nullify the Torah. On the contrary, he says, I've come not to nullify it, but to fulfill it. And he says, therefore, do not think that any of the commandments, the least jot or least tittle of the law shall be passing away. He says, therefore, anyone who teaches that the least of the commandments is nullified, he says, will become the least in the kingdom of heaven. But if people teach to keep the commandments and do them, he will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In a very, very famous passage in the book of Mark, in chapter 10, Jesus is approached by someone who says, Oh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? What must I do to be able to go to the world to come? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. And if you want to go to heaven, keep the commandments. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew, Jesus says that the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sofrim and the Perushim, they sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, everything they do, you shall observe and follow. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He doesn't say follow the teachings of the Sadducees, the Stukim. He doesn't say to follow the teachings of the Samaritans. He says you have to follow the teachings of the Pharisees. We today, as a Jewish community, are the descendants of the Pharisees. It's rabbinic Judaism. So every single word out of the mouth of Jesus was essentially saying in the Christian scriptures that you have to observe the Torah, not just what it says in the written Torah, but the Torah as it's developed through the writings and teachings of the rabbis. When we look at the deeds, the actions of Jesus' disciples, his students, we know that they did observe the Torah. We're told that after the crucifixion, they observed the Sabbath on the seventh day. It says, according to the commandments. There's a very interesting testimony about the early church. And it comes from an ultimate enemy of the early church. We know that Constantine who really was the great promoter of Christianity ultimately in the fourth century, Constantine wanted to homogenize Christianity. And therefore what he did was not just have the Council of Nicaea where they voted to standardize all the doctrines, but they had a, and just instituted a policy of rounding up every heretical sect and their writings and destroying them. So we knew that the people who the church managed to wipe out were the people that were not considered to be historical Christianity. Two of the groups that were persecuted and wiped out were a group called the Nazareans and a group called the Evionites, the Evionim. These were Jewish Christians, descendants of the very early followers of Jesus. And we know about these Evionites and Nazareans from how they are attacked by other Christians later on. What are they attacked for? They're attacked for believing in one God and not the Trinity. They're attacked for getting circumcised and observing all the commandments of the Torah. They're attacked for keeping kosher. And they're attacked for only reading the quote-unquote Old Testament. So we have from Christian sources a fairly clear picture of who the early Jesus movement was. And this all makes sense, and it's the only way of reading Acts chapter 5. Because if Peter was someone who no longer kept the Torah, Right? If Peter said the Torah is finished, and if Peter worshipped Jesus as God, would it have been possible for Rabban Gamliel to say, oh, leave these guys alone, nothing wrong with them. 
Let's just wait and see what happens to their movement. No, Rabbi Gamliel would have said he is basically the greatest violator of Judaism possible. He's denying the entire Torah. He's observing idolatry, worshiping idolatry. Rabbi Gamliel's words only make sense as someone observing a movement that was totally consistent with Judaism. And we're just waiting to see what happens to this Messiah character they're thinking about. I should just say, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, to make it clearer that this passage obviously cannot mean, no one would take this to mean, that if a religion lasts for a long time, it proves that it's true. No Christian today in their right mind would really agree to that. No Christian would say that Rabban Gamliel meant if a religion lasts a long time, that certifies it's true. They wouldn't say that Hinduism is true because it lasted a long time. Christians would not say Judaism is true because it's lasted a long time. So how can we possibly understand those words of Rabban Gamliel? From our point of view. So we know as Jews that idolatry will last until the end of history. The prophet Zechariah, we say it every day in the prayers, Zechariah says, Bayom ha'u yiyeh Adonai echad ushmo echad. On that day, God's name will be one. That's when the Mashiach comes. But until then, there's not going to be complete monotheism in the world. There will be idolatry. So we know that idolatry can last for a very long time. So what might Rabbi Gamliel have meant if he wasn't simply saying that a religion that lasts for a long time is true? We would say in Hebrew that Rabban Gamliel was not speaking klape chutz. He was not speaking as a Jew observing other religions. He was speaking klape pnim. He was speaking in-house. And he was saying, how do we know within Judaism if a movement within Judaism is legitimate? And he was saying, within Judaism, we can observe the legitimacy of a movement if it lasts or if it disappears. We don't have today in the world any Samaritans. We don't have any Essenes. We don't have any Sadducees. All of the heretical movements within Jewish history ultimately did disappear. The movements that might have been a little bit strange at first, Hasidus was looked at as strange 300 years ago. It has proven the test of time. So he might have been speaking on those terms. Now, ultimately, the great challenge to this Christian movement, it wasn't even called Christianity, really, but to the Jesus movement, the ultimate challenge was the crucifixion. At that point, the followers of Jesus were in for a tremendous, tremendous shock. They never expected him to die. That was not the game plan. I once told a story here, actually, a number of years ago about a missionary I met in Tanawanda, New York, near Buffalo, and he was telling me that all the Jews are stupid. And I was a little surprised by that sales technique of his. And he told me that Jews are stupid because we follow the rabbis. What's wrong with the rabbis? He said, look, Michael, your greatest rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, he thought that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. Bar Kokhba was a great Jewish general who led a rebellion against the Romans about 100 years after Jesus. He said, look, Rabbi Akiva, the greatest rabbi, was wrong about the Messiah. Maybe all the rabbis are wrong for rejecting Jesus. So I stole the answer that was given to this question by the Brisker Rav many years before me. And I asked the missionary, I said, why do you think Rabbi Akiva was wrong? Here you think all the Jews are stupid because he was wrong. Maybe he was right. How do you know that Bar Kokhba wasn't the Messiah? And this Christian looks at me with a straight face and says, well, it's obvious he wasn't the Messiah. He was killed by the Romans and failed to bring peace to the world. He was much slower on the uptake. It took him about two minutes to realize he stepped into it. <laughs> anyway, the crucifixion was a tremendous, tremendous problem. How did Christianity survive the crucifixion of Jesus? <clears throat> there was a great social psychologist named Leon Festinger who wrote a book years ago with two colleagues called When Prophecy Fails. And he analyzed a movement of a channeler, or Mrs. Stace, a Marion Keach, who was, I think, in the 50s. She was a channeler who claimed that she received messages from outer space through automatic writing, through an, uh, some ancient being that told her that the world will be destroyed by a flood on a certain date. And she got followers to believe she was a legitimate channeler, and they started saving up tuna fish cans and putting them in the basement for this big flood. 
And what Festinger wanted to see was what would happen when this date came and passed and there's no flood, what's going to happen to her group? So you would think that they would be seeing that she's a false prophet, she's a hoax, and let's get out of here and get a life. So he sent in some graduate students to infiltrate the group to see what was going to happen. And his thesis would, was that the prophecy will not come true, the group will not fall apart, and they'll begin, become more aggressive at trying to convert people after the prophecy failed. That's the thesis of his book. And his psychological principle we know, if you took a freshman psych course, is called cognitive dissonance. That when there's a, 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 a problem, when there's a contradiction between what you believe and reality, you will adjust your beliefs to fit the reality. In the year 1648, Shabtai Tzvi, a great Jewish mystic, claimed to be the Messiah. He gathered a great following among Jews in Turkey, Constantinople, all of uh, that part of Asia, even parts of Europe. Huge following because the Jews had gone through tremendous persecution in the Chemelnitsky massacres, hundreds of thousands of Jews were butchered by Bogdan Chemelnitsky and his Cossacks. So the Jews were desperate for salvation, desperate for a savior. And there were mystics who predicted that in the year 1648, the Messiah would come. So you had these two things, a tremendous desire for the Messiah, these predictions by the mystics. In 1648, he walks right through the door. Hi, I'm the Messiah. And people were desperate for it, and they were following him. What did it mean to follow Shabtai Tzvi as the Messiah? It didn't mean you walked around Constantinople saying, I believe in Shabtai Tzvi. No, it meant you packed your bags, you're going to follow him back to Israel, where he's going to initiate the kingdom of God. And many people sold their homes and sold their possessions, and were following him back to the land of Israel when he was captured by the Turks, thrown into prison, and under pain of death, forced to convert to Islam. So now this guy, who they thought was the Messiah, is rotting in a Turkish jail, and he's a Muslim. You still think he's the Messiah? So many people went back with their tail between their legs, ashamed, going home as broken people, and saying, we blew it. But you should know there were thousands and thousands of Jews who could not accept that bad news. Because they invested so much emotional energy in believing in this guy, it was impossible to give up that belief. It was impossible to say we were wrong. So they started to say, well, the guy in jail is not really Shabtai Tzvi. He's a double. The real one went up to heaven, and he's going to come down soon to bring us back to the land of Israel. And they found passages in the Bible proving that the Messiah was supposed to convert to another religion. This movement persisted even to, to this day there are people who still are followers of Shabtai Tzvi. They're called Dunme. It's a very small sect. They're actually mostly Muslims today. But they still believe in Shabtai Tzvi as the mystical messiah who converted to Islam in the year 1666. In, in Massapequa, Long Island, not many years ago, in the 80s, there was a Lutheran pastor named Jack Hickman who had a small church that really grew as a result of his charismatic leadership. There were thousands of people who joined. Many of them were Jews, because at one point he told his church, if you really want to be good Christians, you have to start living as Orthodox Jews. And they began to circumcise themselves, and the men of the group started keeping kosher very strictly, observing all the Jewish holidays, wearing yarmulkes, wearing talesim. And Jews bought into this big time. They started calling him Abba, and they called the name of the church Congregation Shoresh Yishai, the root of Jesse. And then after many years of leading this group, they discovered that he was a pedophile. He was molesting little boys in the group. They investigated his story. He told them a whole biography of himself, and it was all false. There were lies going on. So you would think after finding out the guy is a liar and a pig, people would just leave en masse. Half of the church left. But half of them could not admit they spent the last 15 years of their life in a disgusting, sick, false group. So they began teaching that, no, this is all part of the plan that in the Jewish mystical teachings, it speaks about the leader having relations with little boys. It's called the ceremony of the passing on of the seed in order to find a successor. And they began to justify his behavior. This is called cognitive dissonance, when it's too difficult to admit that your beliefs were false, especially when you made tremendous investments to have those beliefs. You'll do anything to not give them up. So after years of following Jesus, 
when people left their homes and families and thought he was going to bring salvation to the Jewish people, he's going to redeem the world, it became too difficult to admit that they were mistaken. And they said, okay, he died, but he'll come back. There'll be a second coming. That's how the early church dealt with the death of Jesus. They believed that he would come back. But the belief was not that he'd come back in 500 years or 800 years. If you read the New Testament, the belief was he's coming back soon in this generation. And they put into Jesus, in his mouth, predictions where Jesus says, this generation will not pass away until everything is better. He says, there are those who are here standing that will not taste death until they see me coming to establish the kingdom. That was the belief. But that didn't happen either. So now what happens? They have to explain away why he died when he didn't return. And Christianity begins with the theology of this dead Messiah, with the idea that he died to atone for our sins. Jesus was a sacrifice. And through his death, all our sins can be forgiven. This is the beginning of Christianity. It's essentially a new religion with a new concept of a messiah to accommodate a dead messiah. And there's one problem. Why would his death be special? Aren't there many Jewish martyrs? There were thousands of Jews who were crucified by the Romans. What was so special about the death of Jesus? This led to the deification of Jesus. Well, his death was special because he was no ordinary mortal human being. He was actually God himself. Now, what happened to this movement of Torah observant Jews who ultimately didn't believe that he was God and kept the Torah? We know that after only about 200 years, they completely disappeared. Within 200 years, there are no more traditional Jews following Jesus. And when I read Rabbi Gamaliel's speech in the book of Acts, I say to my Christian friends, I believe what he said is true, that if this movement is of God, it won't disappear. But if it's not of God, it'll disappear. I said it disappeared. The entire movement disappeared. And what happened? I know we're pressed for time. I'll try and condense this. Paul becomes one of the major advocates of Christianity, although Paul never met Jesus. And Paul realizes the Jewish people are not buying into this Jesus movement. So in the book of Acts, chapter 13, Paul says, now that the Jews have rejected all of this, I am going to go to the Gentiles. And Paul tries to convert Gentiles to this movement. And Paul is under great pressure to do two things. Number one, to make this movement more palatable to non-Jews. And that's why we see, ultimately, a grafting into the early Jesus movement a lot of paganism. Christmas, Easter, again, the deification of Jesus. And obviously, Paul will not have an easy time selling this movement if the men have to get circumcised and all the people have to keep all the commandments. So Paul's message begins to become very much an antinomian message. The law has been basically thrown out. So what happens is, in the book of Acts, in the 15th chapter, the first debate in Christian history they have a big meeting in Jerusalem, a meeting between Paul, who was this apostle to the Gentiles, and the church that was still in Jerusalem, Peter and James. And what are they arguing about? They start debating, what do we do with non-Jews, with Gentiles, who want to come into our movement, our movement of Jews that believe in Jesus as the Messiah? Do we have to make them keep all the commandments? Now, again, think about this. If they themselves were not keeping the commandments, they wouldn't be discussing whether we have to make Gentiles coming into the movement keep all the commandments. It's clear that these Jewish people did keep all the commandments. The only question is, what about non-Jews? Do we have to convert them fully and keep all the commandments of the Torah? The resolution was no. They do not have to fully convert. They need just to follow the seven basic Noahide laws of humanity. Not to kill, not to steal, etc. Not to blaspheme, not to worship idolatry. What happens with this institutionalization of the split between the Jerusalem church and this Pauline non-Jewish church starts an entire process where very, very quickly a number of changes happen. Number one, Jesus becomes deified. And the people who now follow Jesus believe he is God himself and worship him as 
a part of the Trinity. The mitzvot, the commandments of God, have been basically completely disallowed, and the church begins to persecute anyone that's observing the Torah. The oral Torah, the rabbinic traditions, are completely trashed. The rabbis are evil. The rabbis are from the devil himself. Atonement comes not through tshuva, not through repentance, but by being covered by the blood of Jesus. The chosen people is no longer the Jewish people. It's the church. We are now the new Israel. And this emerging Christian movement becomes blatantly anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Persecutors of Jews, terrible, terrible both statements and treatment of Jewish people over history. And finally, the last piece is that this movement goes so far from its original Jewish moorings that the Jewishness of Jesus is ultimately emasculated to the point where if you would have stopped any Christian in the world a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, 200 years ago, and tell them, you know, Jesus was Jewish, they would look at you like you were from Mars. That's what happened here over time. A Jewish movement of just Jews, only Jews. Jesus refused to speak to Gentiles. Jesus says, I'm only here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He tells his disciples, do not go to the cities of the Samaritans or the cities of the Gentiles. A movement of only Jews that kept the Torah, that did not believe Jesus was God, simply the Messiah, who they thought would come back someday and bring peace, didn't happen. He emerges into a movement of only non-Jews that are anti-Torah, anti-Jews, and ultimately take away the Jewishness of Jesus. I want to end with one thought, and then I'll take questions. We're now coming full circle. As many of you know, one of the great things that's going on in the world today, not great from our point of view, but interesting from our point of view, is there's a tremendous passion for people to discover who really was Jesus. This is a quest for the historical Jesus. Who were the early Christians? What really happened 2,000 years ago? You have to understand that for so much of church history, these questions are forbidden. Christians were not even allowed to read the Bible for so many years. You know, the first people to translate the Bible, the Christian Bible, into the vernacular were killed. They were burned at the stake. So for so much of Christian history, people were kept in the dark. And now people are finally wanting to know what happened back then. Who really was Jesus? So we're finding movements like the Christian Restoration Movement. Even groups like the Hebrew Christian movements and Messianic movements are all, in some way, movements trying to recover the original purity and authenticity of Christianity. How would Jesus and his fo followers have worshipped? Now, when you ever see on a Christian television show preachers wearing talasim, blowing chauffeurs, having Passover, why are they doing all this? It's not only to convert Jews. A lot of it is their own desperate search for authenticity. Who do we come from? And I'll just submit to you that I think that this search for the truth is going to lead to the unraveling of Christianity. I can just tell you from my own experience that when I attend Jews for Jesus conferences, the number of people each year who tell me privately, not publicly, privately, we don't believe in the Trinity. We believe in keeping the commandments, even following the Talmud and the rabbis. This is growing and growing and growing slowly. It's fringe movement at this point. I went to a conference two years ago in Dallas, Texas, called Nazarene Jews. Not Messianic Jews, Nazarene Jews. They think Messianic Jews are basically off the map not legitimate. These were people, when I go to Messianic Jewish conferences, they will eat any food served in the hotel. They don't care if it's really kosher. They might not eat the pork, but they won't they'll eat any kosher, any food in the hotel. The Nazarene Jews that I was at in Dallas all went to the supermarket to buy kosher food like myself. So this is a movement now that seems to be turning back on itself and slowly, slowly, slowly stripping away the encrustations that developed over history that basically paganized the early Jesus movement and stripped of it of all its Jewishness. And then the question for us, which I'm not going to answer, is how will we as a Jewish community react to and deal with a renewed, or actually going back to its roots Christian world, where the people are much closer to us than we may be comfortable to accept, where there are followers of Jesus who are completely Torah observant, 
do not see him as God. Merely see him as the Messiah who may come back someday. It may be an uncomfortable question for us to think about, but I'll just tell you it's not science fiction anymore. I want to thank you all for inviting me to be here, and if there are questions at this point, I'll be very happy to entertain them. Um, just before we take questions, let's just bench, because I know some people do need to leave. Rabbi Skobak will be very happy to take questions. I know you can... Oh, he says there's propaganda at the back on the table juice for Judaism. They do wonderful work. They've got a website. They need, also need your support. Um, and as I said, Rabbi Skobak is speaking this evening on uh, I was a Jewish anti-Semite, uh, 3000 West Dundee, up in Northbrook at 745. Just uh, another reminder that our next buffet is uh, on September the 10th here at the Crown Plaza Silversmith. Jewish lessons of 9-11. And it'll be Rabbi David, Rabbi Dr. David Gottlieb. So if I can just have a volunteer to lead us in the benching, and then uh, Rabbi Skobach will take questions. Uh, oh, I can, oh, I can see. Um, I need glasses. Um, Mitch Rose. We hear a lot these days about. Uh, in Israel, that the only people coming to tour in Israel are, are Christian groups, and that uh, the millions of dollars that are being spent by uh, Christians uh, for Israel, and there seems to be somewhat of a different feelings about whether this is a good thing or not a good thing. So people feel it's great, you know, that at least that's money, and you know, we really care where it comes from. Other people are more concerned about the possible uh, implications and what's coming along with this. Uh, if you could just comment on this trend. Well, the, the question really is, uh, we're all thinking about this these days, uh, how do we as a Jewish community react to the uh, tremendous surge of support both politically and financially and in terms of visiting Israel from the Christian world? And by Christian world, I'll just define it overwhelmingly the evangelical Christian world, meaning the conservative, born-again Protestants. Uh, we're not seeing this kind of support at all from uh, the Orthodox churches, from the Catholic church, from the liberal Christian churches. As a matter of fact, these liberal groups are, tend to be very, very problematic for Israel, in terms of Israel. So we have about 75 million born-again Christians in North America, and they, generally speaking, are very enthusiastic supporters of Israel. And I think that now, as a community, uh, it's very hard for anyone to really be critical of that. Uh, we're in a very desperate situation. Uh, on the other hand, I think that during less perilous times, we could be more sober. And I'll try to be candid in terms of how I think we need to think about this as a community. Uh, I think it's a double-edged sword. The truth of the matter is that there is a real payoff. There's a tremendous benefit that these people are uh, have for us as a community, both financially and politically. I don't know if the American government today would be such a strong supporter of Israel uh, if it wasn't for the fact that we had a born-again Christian president and a tremendous uh, lobbying effort by these groups. So clearly, they are beneficial in some ways. But I think it's a double-edged sword. And uh, I'll just share one or two thoughts because it's a question that requires an entire speech in and of itself. You have to first of all understand the mentality of these groups. It's very, very important to understand that they are driven by one agenda only. That as much love as they might have for the land of Israel and as much love as they might have for the people of Israel, there is a bottom line for born-again Christians. And that bottom line is Jesus. And well, that second coming is what they believe is going to happen anyway. But in terms of what their bottom line is for us as Jews, it's that we come to Jesus. Now, how do most Christians really feel they'll be able to promote Jesus among the Jewish community? Most of the Christians that are smart realize they're not going to get very far by walking up to most of us and coming with a New Testament and saying, have you ever read the Gospel of Luke? they realize that Jews are not going to be very impressed with most of that stuff. However, there is a verse in the New Testament that is their program for conversion. And I'll tell you this, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. In the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 11, the apostle Paul says, 
that we will provoke the Jews to jealousy. They believe very strongly that with every ounce of good they do to the Jewish people, they're going to provoke us to jealousy. That we as a community are going to say, why do they love us so much? And why do they spend so much time and effort helping us? It must be because of their religious beliefs. And we're going to become impressed with those religious beliefs. I have a friend of mine that converted to Judaism after working for years as a missionary in Israel. His work as a missionary in Israel led him to convert to Judaism, ironically. And he led a program in Israel during the 1980 war in, in Lebanon called Project Kibbutz. And the thesis of Project Kibbutz was that there are a lot of Israeli soldiers that are not on the kibbutzim because they're fighting in the war. So we're going to volunteer to help them by replacing the manpower. So hundreds of Christians went to Israel to volunteer on the kibbutzim. And they were all told two things. One, work very hard and smile a lot and don't talk about Jesus. And they knew that if you talk about Jesus, you're going to scare people off. Keep your mouth shut about Jesus, but work very hard and smile a lot. They were very smart. They knew that people would start to ask them, you know what, you're not even from here. You're not part of this kibbutz. You're not even Israeli. I'm here. I live here. And you work so hard and you're so diligent. Where does that come from? Where do you get your energy? Where do you get your love? That now is the opening. And this is a strategy that's used by all of these groups. How do I know this? Because I read their internal documents. I don't read what they write to the Jewish community. I'm, I don't care what they write to us. I want to read what they say to each other. And they're consistently saying this every single one of these groups that by showing love to the Jewish people, by supporting Israel, we will provoke them to jealousy so they will come to Jesus. I think we need to be aware of this. It doesn't mean we can't take their, their help. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, in some ways cooperate with them and you know, benefit from some of their political help and financial help, but it means not being naive. And it means saying to them in some cases, if you want to help us, fine, but let us provide the service. You want to help Jews from the Soviet Union? You want to raise millions of dollars to bring persecuted Jews from the Ukraine to Israel? Fine, give the money to the Israeli agency. Let them do the schlepping. Don't have Christian missionaries on the buses taking them from the Ukraine to the airport. Because you should know that they give us the impression that these programs are par of. We're just helping to move them from, the, from Russia to Israel. When I go to their church programs, I hear them bragging about how many Jews they've managed to convert in these programs. So I think that we need to be uh, aware, not be naive, but also not close ourselves off to, I guess at these times, especially very important sources of support and help. Yes? Well, I, I will repeat the question. Uh, it, it's sort of like in baseball, you say there's a sort of a, sometimes a fat pitch that you get. Um, so the question is, how do I see the current developments in the Chabad uh, movement among Chabad messianists in relation to what I've said today? I'll, I hope I'm not going to offend anyone, but I'll be very candid and very uh, blunt. My feeling is that psychologically, the same exact mechanisms were in place. That this is a movement that should have recognized that even though, and I'll tell you this directly, that while the Lubavitch Rebbe was alive, if you had to ask me to vote for who I thought was a top candidate for being the Messiah in Potentia, he would have gotten my vote. I think that clear thinking people among Chabad should have recognized that this is not what was supposed to happen. And uh, that would have been the point to say, listen, it would have been great, and better luck next time. And I think that the reaction in Chabad, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about how extensive it is and, and the, the intricacies of the movement, but basically the idea that the game is still continuing, uh, I think is psychologically exactly parallel to the cognitive dissonance that we see in other movements. Um, you know. 
And that I can't speak about because I'm not really, uh, I can guess, but I don't want to guess in public. Yes. Um, I can't see your name tags. I'll just have to point. So, were you here at the beginning today? Okay, so I thought I really covered all this already, but I'll, maybe I'll just recap. Uh, that's okay. Um, it doesn't hurt to, to repeat sometimes. So, the question of how we're to see Jesus, I can't, again, I want to emphasize, I can't say that I'm really clear on that. I could have given a very different speech today uh, and done it probably well. I probably could have told you he was the worst guy in the world and he was an enemy of Judaism and I could have had good sources for it. I personally don't think that was necessarily the case, but I don't have clarity in terms of what I'm presenting either. I think that it's very hard to know what he was like personally. Uh, anyone that thinks they're the Messiah is either a megalomaniac of sorts or expressing a very healthy uh, Im impulse. I think that it's very healthy for every single human being to want to be the Messiah. Because what it's saying is, I would like to change the world for the better. So I think that every person, it would be good if they had less selfishness and self-focus, and more of a feeling that I should live to really help change the world for the better. So I don't know what drove Jesus at all. But it, clearly at some point he came to see himself as the Messiah. Maybe it was adoring fans that pushed him in that direction. I don't know. I was saying today that I think that he was simply making the claim to be Messiah, which simply meant that he was going to become the king of the Jewish people and institute a reign of righteousness and a reign where God is king over the entire world, not himself, but God, and a world of peace where the Jewish people will have political sovereignty over the land of Israel and where the Jewish people will be a light to the nations and spread truth from Israel. Uh, I think that, generally speaking, he was someone trying to promote uh, nothing different than traditional Judaism among his followers, simply the idea that he was the Messiah. Again, I can't prove this. It's a thesis that I think could be substantiated by looking at a lot of the primary evidence. Um, I want to just say, and I'll say this in-house today, that it's a little bit dangerous for me to say what I've been saying. Because let's face the facts. Most Jewish people do not have a very sophisticated education Jewishly. How is it that we've managed to keep so many Jewish people over the course of history from embracing Christianity? Just think about the tremendous attraction Christianity would have for a Jew in the world. First of all, there's the attraction of numbers. You know, one of the uh, experiments I remember from being a freshman at Northwestern, I was a psychology student, not a major yet, but I remember the Ash conformity experiment, where Professor Solomon Ash had a class of students, and he put two lines on a wall, a 19-inch line, a 17-and-a-half-inch line. He asked all the students, are the lines different or the same? And each student was told ahead of time, when we ask you, say the lines are the same. So the first student looks at the lines, they're different, and says, well, they look the same to me. Second student says, the same to me, same to me. The last student didn't know what was going on. And the, the, the experiment was, what's going to happen to the last student? Will the last student say, I don't care what everybody else says. I'm not a sheep. I see two different lines. I'm a man. I'm going to stick to my guns. And they're going to say the lines are different. Or will the last person say to themselves, you know what? They can't all be wrong. You mean they're all wrong? I'm the only one that got it right? That's what he wanted to see. And he found, and I'll never forget this, because this is the only thing I remember from college. <laughs> it's true. That 72% of the participants in this experiment went along with the rest of the group. That frightened me. 
Because what it said to me was that, you know what, the impact of a large group on the thinking of an individual is staggering. So now we live in a world where there are 2 billion Christians and there are 12 million Jews. You don't think that Jewish people are looking over their shoulder and wondering, wait, you mean the whole Christian world is wrong and we're right? A missionary once asked me this. He said, Michael, you're saying that all of us are wrong, 2 billion Christians, and you Jews are right, just 12 million Jews. So I said, you know, a Jew always answers a question with a question. I said, let's go back to the day before Jesus. There were basically a whole world of pagans and a couple of Jews. Who was right, the whole world or the Jews? So he said, obviously, the Jews are right and the whole world was wrong. So I said, why do you think anything's changed since then? So I think that that pressure for us to, to basically embrace the truth of the world is immense. And there are other attractions. So what is it that kept so many Jewish people away from Christianity? It's not that we really, as a Jewish people, knew the truth. If you go out onto the street now and speak to the average Jewish person, and ask them if they believe in Jesus. Says, no, I'm Jewish. I don't believe in Jesus. And you say, why don't you? Because I'm Jewish. We don't believe in him. But why don't you believe in him? Because we're Jewish. Yeah, but why don't you just believe in Jesus? Because we don't. Why not? Because we're Jewish. You see how brilliant that is? And if you say, can you give me three reasons why you don't believe in Jesus? No. Last year, I was invited to speak at a Christian seminary in Toronto. They have a world religions class, and they wanted me to do the, do the Jewish piece. And I walked in and they said, you know, Rabbi, it must be very difficult to be a Jewish person. So I said, why? And they said, because of all the persecution you've gone through from our people. You know, they were doing the Christian self-guilt. So what they really were saying was, and I, I, I got them right on this, they were saying, you know what, it must be very difficult for you to think positively about Jesus because of all the persecution you've had from Christians. And I said to them, you know what, to be honest with you, the persecution by the church has really affected me zero in terms of my assessment of Christianity. I said, you guys could have been the nicest people in the world for 2,000 years. I would still reject Christianity because I don't reject Christianity because you persecuted us. I reject it because it's not true, because Jesus was not the Messiah. The New Testament is not the word of God. So whether you're nice or not nice, Mormons are the nicest people in the world. Doesn't mean I'm going to embrace Mormonism. Now. We have a Jewish people whose level of inoculation against Christianity is pathetic. So for me to say publicly, well, let's think about them more objectively, right? Let's be more sober in our assessment. Jesus may not have been the great enemy of Judaism that many people assume he was. I might be doing the wrong thing, maybe a disservice to the public. But I think I have maybe a more sophisticated group here. And I think that it doesn't help to protect ourselves with information that may not be true. Psychologically, the good cop, bad cop uh, dynamic is very powerful. And if you try to inoculate Jews against Christianity by saying they hate us and they're enemies of Judaism, and then the average Jew meets Christians who are sweet and nice and loving, you're setting them up for disaster. So I think the only thing that'll protect us is truth. And we don't have to use hysteria to keep people away from Christianity. So just to get back to your question, I don't think that I feel comfortable saying unequivocally that Jesus was an enemy of Torah. I think that the way I read the evidence is that his movement was, was basically a Torah observant movement. Um, I believe that we don't know a lot about him personally. And the third part of your question I forgot already what was? Oh, so that basically goes back to the prior question. Uh, how do we assess the support of uh, the Jewish people and, and Israel by the evangelical Christian community. I okay, so I'm not sure I understand the difference. No, I think that there's no reason in the world why you should be supporting the Christian coalition. Meaning that I don't think it's necessary for you to be attacking it necessarily these days. Um, again, maybe you should. I think you have to do your own investigation. But I think that I got a call a few weeks ago in Toronto. Someone asked me the same question. Should I be sending a check to Yechiel Atzlin's group? I said, no. You could send a group to a check to a Jewish group. He's raising money among Christians. So there's no reason for a Jew to support them financially. Uh, we really could support our own charities, our own in-house uh, tzedakahs. You know, the question is, should we be uh, in encouraging them morally or should we be opposing them morally? Again, I think it's too difficult to really address that here. Uh, at this time, it's a complex issue. 
And I think, again, it has to be analyzed intelligently. Uh, yes. God forbid. God forbid. I mean, often Jews say that, well, Jesus wasn't God, but he was a great prophet. We have no reason to think he was a great prophet. We have no reason to think he was that great of anything. You know, a friend of mine once said that there are many new and wonderful things in the New Testament. The only problem is that whatever is new is not wonderful, and whatever is wonderful is not new. <laughs> there is not one word in the Christian scriptures that's really original. Uh, I, I spoke to someone recently, you know, they were, they were so enamored with the personality of Jesus, and they said, look what he taught. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So my friend told this person, you know, that's from the Hebrew scriptures. He said, you've got to be kidding. That's impossible. So the truth is that it was actually a six-volume book in German written by Strack and Billerbach, which found Jewish sources in the Bible and Talmud for every word coming out of his mouth. And now, I'm saying, I'm saying but I, so that's, I, could, I could quote, original, fine, I'm just saying, I could quote the Talmud also. It doesn't make me a great rabbi. I just read the Talmud. I'm saying I don't want to make someone bigger than they are simply because they're quoting Jewish sources. I mean, I could do the same thing. So I think it's dangerous for us to say he was like Jeremiah or Isaiah. Why would we think that? First of all, we didn't have prophecy at that time anyway. Right? There were no more prophets at the time of Jesus. So to make him into a prophet, I think, is giving him more kavo than anyone would deserve. And there's no evidence that he was even a great teacher or a great rabbi. Right? Now, this is where we get into a little bit of delicate issues here because the Talmud may or may not be speaking about Jesus, right? The Talmud has passages where he may have been a student of Yahushua ben Prachya. That's a very difficult proposition in terms of the timeline, right? Christianity has him living about 160 years after he should be living at that point. So it's not clear who the Talmud is speaking about. And that's why I said this is a difficult subject because it's not clear the information is murky. But I think that there's no reason to give him more kavod. I don't want to take away kavod that he may, you know, may have been a nice guy, right? But I don't think that we need to say he was a great teacher or a great rabbi or a great, there's no evidence that he was, right? I just, and I want to read there. I'm, I'm reading it from here. I'm not reading uh, anti-Jesus book. I'm with their book. I read it a million times. I don't see any evidence that he was great, right? He thought he was the Messiah. So, <laughs> mazel tov. Yes. <laughs> It's a very interesting question. You know, one of the things that, that people have struggled with is to understand how is it that Christianity became so popular? What was the ingredients for its success? So one of the things that we know from history was that prior to Christianity, there was a huge movement in the world that were called Yire Elohim, fearers of God. And these were Gentiles who were enamored with Jews and with Judaism. You have to appreciate the fact, 2,000 years ago, in the world, you were either Jewish or you were pagan. And they were not Harvard-educated pagans. These were basically barbarians. These are people who worshipped rocks and trees and sticks and cockroaches and bugs. And these are people that were brutal. The Romans were insanely brutal. So we had a brutal, disgusting, sick world. Then you had basically this monotheistic island of Judaism. And don't think that it didn't have an impact on the world. There were at least a million that we know of Gentiles who said, you know what, the Jews are amazing. They're ethical, they're sweet, they're spiritual, they don't, they're not violent, they have this pure religion. They were very impressed with us. The problem was that the price tag to convert was very, very high, right? 2,000 years ago, circumcision may not have been as surgically precise as it is today. <laughs> and keeping all the commandments was not so simple. So these are people that loved Judaism, were fascinated with Judaism, but didn't want to fully convert, right? So what they did was they used to hang out in the back of the synagogues, and they would basically be uh, wannabes. They were Jewish wannabes. Now, Paul comes along, and Paul tells the world, you know what? We have a, a big sale on Judaism. The price has been slashed to zero. So now, among all these people who were so enamored with Judaism, right, now they are told they can get in for free. All you have to do is say you believe in Jesus. So how did all this happen? Were there Jews that were uh, promoting Judaism in the world 
I have to tell you that I don't know. Um, there are scholars who claim that Jews were evangelistic and were promoting Judaism. They were seeking proselytes. I, I, I tend not to believe that. I think that there were enough sources in Judaism that said that was not our approach and that we didn't encourage people to convert. Uh, there's, there's no evidence that I know of that there were people doing that either. Uh, it could be that there was. You know, one of the problems we don't have, uh, you know, back copies of the New York Times from back then, so we don't necessarily know very, very well and clearly what happened. I'm not aware of any clear evidence that there was a, a organized movement among Jews to promote monotheism. But don't forget, the best sales program is one where you're not trying to sell, meaning that we spoke for ourselves. Just being Jews in the world was itself a tremendous promotion. So we may not have had websites promoting, we may not have had storefront operations or salespeople going around telling these people, you know, you should follow the seven laws of Noah. But I think that what happened was just by being in the world, we impressed people. Now, I'll just share with you one more thought. That another reason aside from this, and aside from the fact that Constantine, who was the tacit ruler of the entire world, I mean, think about the fact that in the year 325, approximately, when Constantine embraced Christianity, he ruled the whole known world. So when he embraced Christianity and then forced every citizen of the world to become a Christian, that got Christianity off to a very big head start. And there's a third thing. Think about this. I can't, again, promote this. I can't tell you I know for first true, but Maimonides said this. The Rambam said that, you know what, maybe in God's inscrutable ways, inscrutable plans, God intended, possibly, possibly, for Christianity to be an instrument in the spreading of the ultimate truth. Why? We, we, are know, we know from the Bible that when Mashiach comes, right, it's going to change the world. When the Messiah comes, it's going to change the world. The world is going to have a tremendous, tremendous exposure to Judaism, to Torah, to truth. The question is, what kind of a reaction would the Messiah have in a pagan world? You see, in a pagan world, there's no interface. There's no, we don't engage paganism. Maimonides says that by the spread of Christianity and Islam, it's almost the whole, whole world today, Maimonides says, you know what? The whole world knows about the Torah, about the idea of one God, about the idea of the Messiah. And Maimonides seems to say that with the, I don't know, I, I'm just going to use a bad metaphor, so I'll forget that. But with the preparing of the ground, right, with Christianity and Islam, with these ideas, that engaged the rest of the world with Judaism. We're competitors, right? We have, we're, we're, we compete with each other. The Bible says to us, it's very interesting, the Bible says that when the Messiah comes, the rest of the world is going to basically say, you know what? We finally realize that we were wrong and the Jews were right. It's repeated three or four times in the Bible. The Gentiles and nations of the world are, are, are going to come to us and they're going to say, you Jews teach us about God because we heard God is with you. It's amazing. I don't know how Christians read this verse in the Bible. It says they're going to come to the Jew. They're going to grab the corners of the garment of a Jew. It's in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 23. And they're going to say, we want to follow you. We've heard that God is with you. So this is a constant theme in the Bible. And I think that it would be hard to imagine this happening in a world that was pagan. Maimonides suggests that that might be one of the reasons why Christianity has, and, and Islam have been so successful in the world. We have time for one more question. I don't know who's the, the timekeeper here. Let, let's just wait. Let's get the first time callers, and then we'll come back. Are you familiar okay. <laughs> with Constantine's sword? Yes, I'm familiar with the book. I, I bought it when it came out in paperback, and it's sitting in my to-read pile. But I, I, I've heard of the book, and I, I heard it's interesting. Okay, uh, is is that it for today? <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. And uh, I would like to really wish you all a very, very special and successful and sweet New Year. And we should all, as a people, have a tremendous amount of uh, happiness and peace next year. Thank you all very much.